and welcome to Talk Back, the show where we ask tough, compelling questions from tough, compelling people. She is a former nun who became disenchanted with the religion but found it again through inquiry. She is the author of several books from the life of the Buddha to that of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and even the history of God. Some call her the foremost authority on world religion today. We call her the Oracle. Karen Armstrong, welcome to Talk Back. Thank you. I'm going to start with a quote. You, you said in, uh, back in 2005 at a talk at Cornell University, uh, referring to how uh, human beings attempt to understand God, you said it's like a goldfish trying to understand a computer. Please expand. We can't understand God. God, as the Muslims remind us, is uh, always greater, Allahu Akbar, always greater than we conceive. All right, well, let's talk about the uh, limited human mind. How do you reconcile believers with non-believers today? And I use those terms generally. Uh, yes, well, I think the word belief uh, has uh, rather bedeviled the problem. Uh, we use the word belief only since the 18th century to describe something that, an opinion, an idea that we hold. Up until the 18th century, the word believe meant to love, to hold dear, to prize. Well, there's a schism today between two, isn't there? Across several divides, belief and non-belief. People who understand and people who completely don't understand. Yes, uh, I th that there, probably, there is, and there's also great conflict between the believers. Uh, people who hold different opinions about God, uh, opinions which they take to be absolute. Uh, and are not willing to compromise on. So there's, there's conflict everywhere in our world today, not just between uh, those of faith and those without. But being what you refer to yourself as, being a freelance monotheist, what would you say to people who don't understand what that means? Who have no idea? Uh, well, I, I will try to explain it to them, uh, simply. Um, I uh, made that remark in a r flippant, offhand way, and it's dogged me with interviews like yourself ever since. Uh, it was a way of saying that I see all three of the monotheisms as equal and valid. I cannot see one of them as superior to any of the others, and I draw nourishment from all three. So you pick and choose? No, I don't pick and choose. I devote my entire day to the study of all three, um, as well as to the other world religions. At the moment, I would describe myself as a religious convalescent. So you found religion through study. You, you found it again. But what about blind faith? Do you think blind faith exists? What about people who, who know God through blind faith? Uh, well, um, I don't like the idea of blind uh, because enlightenment is about seeing, seeing in a different way. Um, someone who believes mindlessly is just simply an automaton. Uh, so you, religion and religious conviction is something one cultivates in oneself. Uh, one doesn't just get an infusion of it and do it automatically. You cultivate it as you cultivate an aesthetic sense, like an appreciation of art or music. But over the years, if you train your ear, you learn to be able to listen. And it's the same with religion. So you don't believe in blind faith, bottom line. But a lot of people do. Millions well, good, do. Good. I don't care what people believe um, as long as they interpret their beliefs in a compassionate way. Uh, and this is not my little idea only. All the world religions, whatever they are, from the Oriental, Buddhist, non-theistic religions to the monotheisms, all insist that the test of any religiosity is not what you believe, but whether you translate those beliefs into a com compassionate, practical action and learn to see the divine or the sacred in the other. All right, let's get political. The divide between the church and the state, or the mosque and the state, call it what you may. Is it just human construct we've uh, created to make ourselves happy and a little more uh, politically correct, or does it actually exist? Can it really be implemented? Uh, well, um, it's, uh, this, the separation of church and state is, uh, or, or rather, let's say uh, more accurately, uh, the separation of religion from politics and, and government is a modern invention, uh, again, dating from the European Enlightenment. And it sprang up from the horrors of uh, 16th and 17th European history 
where there had been hideous religious wars, uh, largely as an offshoot of Europe's mod modernization. Uh, Europe was at that time making the painful transition from pre-modern to uh, the modern society, uh, and which is always a troubling, violent and disruptive process. Uh, and uh, the wars of religion made the Enlightenment philosophers determined to keep religion and politics separate. And that works for us in the West. Um, but, uh, but... Uh, what do you mean by that, works for us in the West? Can't work for the rest of us? It may not be what, it, what, what you want. Um, uh, there are a lot of people, say, in the Middle East, who, you see, don't, we, we developed our secular institutions over a long period. It took us uh, two or three hundred years to develop our secular institutions. And often middle, some Middle Eastern countries, for example, have had to secularize in a mere 50 years very rapidly. And so often that has been too accelerated, too rapid. And as a result, uh, people, uh, ordinary people, have often felt secularization to be an attack upon faith. For example, when Ataturk secularized Turkey, he closed down all the madrasas uh, and he forced, abolished the Sufi orders and forced the Sufis underground. And that seemed like an assault upon religion. So are you saying Middle Eastern and perhaps South Asian or rather Islamic countries generally are not ready for the separation? Is no, that what they may, they, it, it's something some, some, you may want and do as you choose. Um, and of course, you, you, you know, uh, it's fine. But in Pakistan, for example, you have a, quite a strong debate as to how do you create a secular Islamic state, a secular Muslim state? And that's an interesting, difficult question. What's your prescription? I don't have a prescription. Why not? Uh, I think it's too complicated. and It's not for me to say. I'm not a Pakistani. All right. Being a natural combatant, people say that believing in one religion or the other makes you a natural combatant, a natural ideologue, physical, philosophical or moral. It pits you against another religion or another god. It's an automatic response to believing in one god. What do you think? I think that's um, a rather s sort of simplistic idea. Uh, combat anything combative is actually uh, antipathetic to religion. All the major world religions, and here I include Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, uh, Christianity, uh, Judaism and Islam, took their roots in a revulsion from violence of any sort. Even here in the subcontinent, the ideal of ahimsa, uh, non-violence, was absolutely central to the religious quest. And that included aggressive speech, uh, aggress impatient gestures, and um, unkind thoughts of the other. So, but of course, ego gets in the way. And uh, people, a lot of people don't, uh, it, it's, uh, and when we identify ourselves very strongly with our opinions and we say, this is right and you're wrong, what we're, we are doing is asserting the ego. And again, all the world religions say that it's egotism in one way or another that separates us from what we call God. Also, we're naturally susceptible to egotism. Then. Yes, uh, but people have found, uh, and this is one of the discoveries of the religious quest, that if you systematically, and this is what your Su um, Sufi mystics have said for a long time, divest yourself of the ego, take away the veils of egotism, then you begin to encounter the divine in yourself. The Buddhists would say the same thing. It's the Christian experience too. If we, we are programmed probably for egotism, uh, when we came out of our caves and tried to survive against difficult predators and uh, to find food when there wasn't enough around, we had to fight for ourselves, our tribe, our people. We are poised for self-defense. If someone attacks us, we hit back. Now, if we can uh, take ourselves out of that uh, self-centered, uh, self-preoccupied mentality, we may put ourselves into an alternative state of consciousness. Well, by that point of view, we are naturally susceptible. If you're saying that when we came out of our caves, it's st it started happening since then, then is religion the best option to take? 
Oh, well, people have again found that uh, religion uh, is an enhancement of humanity. Again, your Sufi mystics say that, first of all, you experience a self-annihilation, funda, and then uh, you get back a fuller humanity, bakka. And this is very much the same kind of ideas you have in, in Buddhism, Christianity, etc. People say that what holds us back from our best selves is selfishness, greed. And if we can get beyond that, get beyond that self-preoccupation that looks at something and says, do I like this? Do I want this? Do I agree with this? I, I, I. And see things without that filter of distorting egotism, we experience something larger, a larger and enhanced humanity. All right, we have to take a short break here. We're with Karen Armstrong. You're watching Talk Back. Do not go anywhere. Welcome back to Talk Back. We are with Karen Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong, is God a he or a she? Neither. God transcends uh, gender as God transcends all aspects of personality. God includes personality, uh, but God goes beyond that. Then why do most people refer to him as a he? Uh, well, because God, uh, the God of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam began as irredeemably male uh, in the early uh, books of the uh, Hebrew Bible. But over the years, uh, Jews, Christians and Muslims all refined that idea. What do you think that says about the basis of the construct? Doesn't it mean it's essentially male dominated? Yes, I think, th I think there's always been that tendency. You think tendency. that's a good thing? No, I, I, I didn't say that it was a good thing at all, or, nor did I imply it. Um, I think that this has been, I was about to go on to say that this has been a flaw in the monotheisms, which actually many of them have recognized. And many of uh, the mystics, again, uh, have tried to introduce the female and to point out the, uh, that God includes both of the sexes. But of course, yes, all the male, all the religions of the world have been male dominated. See, then the natural question then is, was God invented by man? Oh, cert it, certainly. Uh, the idea of God is a man-made creation. But uh, the, uh, the world religions say that our ideas of the divine cannot measure up to the absolute reality itself. They are a symbol uh, that we use to help us to focus on the transcendent. So then you're saying if they are a symbol which helps us to focus on the transcendent, but yet is a human construct. I don't see the two reconciled, but if man invented God. No, I said man invented the idea of God, theology, the study of God, and that includes the, uh, the idea that we have of God, is our human way of talking about the divine. But uh, Allahu Akbar, God is always greater than our human words. When, and part of the discipline of uh, religion is to remind us that uh, when we confront the absolute, Nirvana, Brahman, Tao, God, we're at the end of what words and thoughts can do, rather in the same way as when you uh, listen to a great piece of music. And often, in uh, the concert hall, when the last notes die away, there's a pause of silence before the applause begins. Theology is not meant to be statements about God. It's meant to be poetry. And a really great poem leaves you often with a sense of wonder or awe. Religion is very much more akin to art than to exact statements of philosophy. It's always expressed itself best in terms of uh, music, painting, dance, art, then, architecture. Then why is it so absolute? Well, this is again, you mean theology, so this is a temptation of religious people uh, to, uh, to mistake their ideas and think uh, that they've got God in their pocket. That's a very dangerous thing. Once you say, I understand God, uh, he, he's in my, we fits very nicely into my human system. You're beginning to lose uh, the whole idea of the, of the ultimate mystery of the divine. Okay. Historically, why have there been less women in the history of God 
than men. Because, as I say, all the world religions, without exception, uh, have been uh, male-dominated and hostile to religion, to women. And this has been one of their great failings, I think. Uh, I make no uh, bones about that. Why would feminists believe in God if he was such a man? Such well, a he. Well, God is not a he. Uh, it's, the, it's the human practitioners, uh, who in, uh, male practitioners, who have often put that spin on God. And women have found their own way of getting around this. At the moment, uh, in many of the um, religions, women are um, making some kind of comeback and are pointing out that, um, uh, you know, that the, 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 that half the human race has been missing from this story. Though one has to say, coming back to Islam, for example, and I would say the same of Christianity, that the Prophet Muhammad uh, was himself very pro the emancipation of women, and uh, he gave in, um, women um, a great deal of respect in his ordinary life, and the Quran gives women rights of inheritance and divorce, for example, a legal status that Western women wouldn't have until about the 19th century. But that hasn't translated uh, no. very well down the ages, no. has it? No. no, because what happens, and the same was true of Christianity in the, in the, in the, in the New Testament, Christian, Christians uh, said that in Christ there was neither male nor female, that the new life had transcended these old gender barriers. But of course, after a few generations, the males in both religions hijacked the faith and dragged it back to the old patriarchy. So if faith is susceptible to being hijacked, then why bother with it at all? Well, why bother with art? Just, uh, are you going to abolish all art just because some people produce horrible daubs instead of uh, masterpieces? Or are you going to ban all music because a lot of people write bad or uh, inferior or even mediocre music? Uh, this, we have a yearning for excellence. And we also have a wonderful capacity as, uh, as human beings for ruining something good. But art doesn't promise you the afterlife. Art doesn't say that I am absolute, believe me, or die. Uh, well, neither does the best kind of religion. I would say that... that some religions do. Uh, well, uh, some, but I would say, uh, as the Buddhists would say, unskillful religions do. You've called some religions bad and some religions no, good. No, I would say some aspects. Uh, at their essence, all the world religions teach that God is absolute. Very few of them. Uh, actually promise afterlife. Uh, that's not a preconception of many. Uh, it's Christianity and Islam that are pretty unique in imagining an afterlife. And they all insist uh, on the transcendence of the divine. Now, there are practitioners within those religions, often, who make the, the kind of absolute simplistic claims that you've mentioned. See, I'm just curious, because in a PBS interview, 3rd of January 2002, with uh, Bill Moyers, the question by Bill was, uh, if you were God, would you do away with religion? And you said, well, there are some forms of religion that must make God weep. There are some forms of religion that are bad. Just as there's bad cooking or bad art or bad sex, you have bad religion too. Yes, you do. I mean, uh, you have a bad religion where people use religion to be cruel to one another. Uh, to make absolutist, uh, unrealistic claims for one another. Uh, this is, this is un uh, as the Buddhists would say, unskillful religion. But then, who is anybody to decide what bad religion is? Well, the, relig the, the great uh, luminaries of the past, as I have said, insist that the test of religion is that it issues in practical compassion. And uh, they found also, and they've done that, not just because it sounds good, because they found by trial and practice that it works. Uh, that if you systematically, day by day, uh, dethrone yourself from the center of your world and put another there, you do, they say, experience an enhancement of being. But of course, a lot of religious people don't want to be compassionate particularly they would prefer to be right. So is there an afterlife? I have no idea. Then why call it a red herring? Uh, it's, I, I, I just don't think it's central to the religious life. I, uh, and I hear I, with the Jewish people who say, what we have is now. We have, and, and day by day, hour by hour, we have now. 
Uh, and as St. Paul said, the, one of the great founders of Christianity, I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, nor hath it entered into the hearts of man what things God has prepared for him after his death. So that, uh, and if that's good enough for St. Paul, it's good enough for me. I prefer to be agnostic about these things, like the Buddha, who always refused to answer questions about the afterlife because, uh, or whether a Buddha existed in Nirvana after his death, because he said that we have no words or ideas, no evidence for this. Leave it alone. It's a symbol a great, uh, of, of, of a sense that we, we go on in some way, but who knows? I'm, I'm happy to be uh, agnostic about it, but if other people want to be, um, to, to, to see, to look forward to a heavenly existence, then that's fine again, as long as they uh, translate these beliefs into a compassionate, benevolent attitude to others in this world. Islamic scholar. Some people say that Islamic scholarship within the Islamic world is dead. Do you agree? Well, I've, um, people say it about the Christian world too, and in both cases I've met some really interesting Muslim thinkers. Uh, no, I wouldn't say it's dead. I think it's very difficult, however, to be creative at a time when people feel under attack. Uh, we know it in our personal lives. If we feel in some way got at, or our careers in jeopardy, or uh, we, we feel we're in a hostile environment, uh, I find myself, I, my, my writing seizes up. Um, I, I, I become defensive uh, and poised against attack and any creative ideas dry up. And I think people in the Muslim world, and they have good reason to, do feel under attack at the moment, not only with weapons, uh, but also uh, ideologically. There's a great deal of Islamophobia in the Western world. Uh, and uh, a great deal of hostility to Islam. 9-11 has made life very, very difficult for Muslims. And that tends to th mean that Muslims are often on the defensive. And I, I, I've been on panels with Muslims where I've seen how it can be for them when they confront the rest of the world. So, um, so if there's not much creativity at the moment, perhaps that's not surprising in the present climate. But you've said that fundamentalists are children of modernity. They come from the modern world. Why can't Islamic thought well, come as a counter-revolution? Yeah, I, th I hope it will. Uh, I, that, that, is, that is my hope. And there are uh, scholars who are attempting this. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, but fundamentalism, you see, encapsulates that defensive attitude. So it's easier, if you like, to be a fundamentalist when you feel under attack. Every fundamentalist movement that I've studied in Judaism, Christianity and Islam is rooted in a profound fear, a fear of annihilation um, and uh, a fear that, the, that um, uh, re the liberal establishment or the uh, secular establishment perhaps. wants to wipe them out. Uh, they don't like the way that religion is being pushed to the sidelines. Even in the United States, uh, there are Christians in small town America who feel, as it were, colonized uh, by the uh, secular ethos of Harvard or Yale or Washington DC. And they've developed this defensive spirituality uh, that often goes on the attack uh, to uh, ward off extinction. And yet a country like America plugs down democracy, everybody else's throat and plugs yes. down. Yes. Why? Why do you think that is? Uh, ego, <laughs> national ego, I think. Uh, democracy uh, is part of the modernization process and uh, it, will, it comes in its own good time. It's a good w system of government, but like any system of government, it has flaws. All right, let's go back to uh, scholarship. We took a detour there. You think something like Ijtihad can be brought back today? Yes, I do. Do you think there's a need for it? Yes, and it's never been entirely dead, you know. Even when the gates of Ishtihad were actually closed uh, officially in the 14th, 15th century, Ibn Taymiyyah came right out and said, no, open them. Uh, we've got to keep thinking critically. And in Iran, for example, uh, the, the Shiite world, uh, the gates of Ishtiha were, nev were never closed. And indeed, uh, fundamentalism is a form of Ishtiha. It is um, innovative, uh, it 
is a new thought. It's a new response to the situation. And I agree. I wish we could have some non-fundamentalist uh, scholarship uh, coming out to really grapple with the needs of our time and above all, with the paramount need we have in our world to create a global community. Is religion fundamentally political? Because some people say that it is the largest form of political organization known to man. I think we, we're seeing a great deal of highly politicized religion at the moment. That, that includes the fundamentalism that we have spoken of. Now, I, insofar as religion must, if it's a, to retain its compassionate mandate, look out for the health of society, for the poor, the oppressed, wherever they are, in whatever part of the world, then religion is political because it must care about the way things happen. That doesn't mean that we all have to jump in to become president of the United States or say prayers before every uh, meeting of Congress. Uh, but that uh, I, re prophetic religion uh, has a long tradition go in, going right back to the uh, Hebrew scriptures of speaking against the establishment on behalf of the people. Uh, and that was the, in, in the, uh, for many, many years in the Muslim world and in the Shiite world, right up to the time of the Iranian Revolution. That was the task of the ulama. But um, effectively, the gatekeepers of religion have always used it politically, even for the social welfare aspect. Uh, taking care of widows or the poor has been inducted into mainstream politics. Yes. Taxation, zakat, etc. Yes. So it's almost as if a system of government is inherent within religion. Is uh, that fair? Uh, well, I think you can say that uh, that some religious leaders be often behave like religious politicians, uh, endlessly pushing their own party, their own sect, unable to, uh, th their own kind of interests. Uh, and, uh, and, and yes, and, and there is, but and insofar as the secular state has picked up on some of the insights of religion, um, that is, that is uh, important. But there is, you know, that, that has been an important sim relationship. But uh, religion must remain compassionate if it's to be authentic, in my view, and in the view of the great sages like the Buddha and Jesus and Muhammad. And uh, politics is a very dirty business often. It's to do with self-interest, with promoting my country, my party. We know there's corruption, there's uh, uh, cruelty in politics. We've, we see it day by day in, in East and West. Uh, and so uh, insofar as uh, politics is about greed and self-advancement and interest. But, but isn't religion and politics aren't the two natural allies? Uh, well, they can be. Easily uh, mergeable with yes. each other. Yes, and religion can certainly be co-opted, uh, as can other human activities, greed, ambition, uh, etc. Art even has been suborned uh, to serve certain uh, regimes, you think of fascist art, Soviet realist art. All right, let's get a little more political. They say, at least in this part of the world, some people say that there's no winning from the fundamentalists because they believe in God. What do you think? This phenomenon is more about trying to live a godly life or a religious life in a world that seems increasingly hostile to faith and only a tiny, tiny proportion of people who adopt this defensive form of spirituality, take part in acts of terror and violence. And indeed, um, one could call this a sort of post-fundamentalism in a sense, light years away from the fundamentalism of the 1960s and 1970s. Well, can these guys be beaten? Uh, Is there a solution? We can't. Uh, I, th I think uh, that we're in a dangerous standoff here. I think if you look at the war on terror, uh, you have the United States, uh, you have Al-Qaeda say, neither can actually defeat the other. Uh, whether Osama bin Laden is dead or alive makes very little difference because the brand is out there now. The trick is, it is to prevent a bleed of young people away from the mainstream into these extremist movements. A poll 
uh, recently conducted by Gallup, which is just about to be published, I don't know if you've seen it, has done extensive uh, interviewing in about 35 Muslim countries and has found that uh, only 92, that only about 8% of the interviewees uh, felt that the 9-11 attacks were justified. 92% roughly uh, felt that it could not be justified. They may not have liked Western policy, but they did not feel that uh, these attacks were justified. And it's interesting that the, uh, the people who uh, supported the Al-Qaeda uh, atrocities um, used secular arguments, bad foreign policy on the part of the West, uh, Israel, Palestine, etc. Whereas the 92% of Muslims who disagreed with the atrocities used religious arguments uh, to counter uh, this saying, quoting, for example, the Quranic verse that says to take one life is to destroy a whole world. So the trick now, the offensive now, uh, is to prevent, keep it at only 8% and not by our Western policies, among others, and, uh, and perhaps malaise in some Muslim countries, make people, make young people despair of the ordinary political processes and resort to terror. Well, there was a poll recently published in Pakistan as well, which was highly contradictive. Uh, majority of the nation was against the war on terror. Oh, I, the war on terror. A majority of the nation was against the fighting, but a majority of the nation was still still was on the side of the militants. Well, uh, I th there, you, there you have it. Who these polls, who knows? I, you give your poll, I give mine. I, I have nothing more to say. War on terror, I think, has been a very bad idea. Um, even calling it a war has been counterproductive. Uh, you're dignifying the extremists with the status of warriors. And these are criminals. Um, and uh, it... Uh, it, 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 it's falling into this uh, fundamentalist mindset that sees two camps. This is a criminal activity and it should have been, I think, dealt with in a legalistic way, bringing people to the international court rather than bombing people and killing civilians. And look at the greed that's happened with the war in Iraq, we had a quite illegal and nefarious war. Uh, and what has been shown if you, uh, in uh, the um, uh, uh, history of these fundamentalist movements worldwide, is that when you attack them, they become more extreme. Uh, and that's not surprising, because when uh, these people believe that they're about to be exterminated or annihilated, as I said earlier, that these movements are all rooted in fear, when you come after them with guns, uh, this confirms their suspicion that you really are out to destroy uh, their, the, them and their religion. Um, so, uh, I, I, and, and so, and Pakistan is really right on the front line here. That was my next question, that what would you say to uh, good old middle class tax-paying citizens of Pakistan who support Osama bin Laden? Uh, well, I, um, I would say that th this will be... Uh, a disaster uh, for Islam and for the world. That's all. Um, but you know, I I understand their disillusion with the West, uh, and I understand uh, that uh, th there have been political injustices and a political imbalance in the world, political injustices and st that have rem that have, have been allowed to fester and become symbolic that have poisoned people's mind, and given them a sense that there's nothing to lose, uh, that there is a sort of hopelessness and an impotence, a helplessness, which may, drives people to extremism. The suicide bomber feels that he or she has nothing to lose, and that's a very dangerous state of affairs. Uh, I would see, however, uh, these movements as fueled by politics rather than religion, to be honest. Their respond I see them almost as a form as a sort of religiously uh, expressed form of nationalism or identity rather than inspired from religion. You can pick out verses of scripture to justify anything, uh, but if you're going to bomb a London bus, uh, you, you, you don't do that because you've read a verse in the Quran. 
Uh, if you listen to what the bombers, the, one of the suicide bombers said on his farewell video, uh, he did it because of political reasons, because of the war on terror, the atrocities in Iraq, the death of Iraqi civilians, an appalling number of civilian catastrophes in Iraq, the Abu Ghraib disaster, uh, the um, Guantanamo Bay, uh, Palestine, the sufferings of Muslims in Gaza and the West Bank. We're going to take a short break here with Karen Armstrong. You're watching Talk Back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Talk Back. We are with Karen Armstrong. All right, well, let's go on the other side. Uh, this is a quote from yours. I think a lot of people in Europe, the more they read, the more they think religion is rubbish. And I'm not sure that this is a particularly bad thing because atheism historically has always been the denial of a particular conception of the divine or the sacred, not a denial, a blanket denial of the sacred per se. So are you, are you protecting atheism? No, uh, but... Uh Jews, Christians and Muslims at an early stage of their history were all called atheists by the pagan establishment of their time. Not because they didn't believe in God, obviously they did, but because their conception of the sacred or God was so different, so radically different and revolutionary that it seemed blasphemous to many people. And that's what I meant by saying it was a time when people were moving from one conception of the divine to the other. What's happening in Europe um, is, I, I'm writing a book about it at the moment, so if I come back in a year's time, you can ask me, I'll be able to answer you in more detail. Isn't Europe supposed to be the most atheistic is, uh, yes. place in the world, yes. generally speaking? I look at my country, Britain, where only 6% of the population attend a religious service regularly, and I wouldn't mind betting that a large proportion of that, that 6% are Muslims who have helped to bump up our national average. Um, but, and it, it, it is really among the chattering classes in London, it's almost de rigueur to be atheist and to hold religion in disdain. My own feeling about this is it's due to the horror of the 20th century in Europe. Um, atrocities such as Auschwitz during World War II, in which many of the churches were implicated, people at, have questioned the idea of the benevolent, omnipotent God. How could such a God, who, if he is to all powerful, all compassionate, have allowed this? Asking hard questions, and these, it's right that these questions should be un, are asked. All right. Well, about the Axial Age, you've been big on the Axial Age, where uh, Taoism, Buddhism, uh, the Greek rationalism, uh, within a span of around six, seven hundred years, came together unconnected, but still started thinking along the same lines. Yes. Do you think there's going to be another one of those? We've had it. We're in the throes of an axial age right now. Start, but our axial age is not religious so much as scientific, technological. Our scientific revolution has utterly transformed the way we think. And our geniuses have been uh, Einstein, uh, Freud, uh, Bill Gates, Stephen Hawking, uh, they've not been people like the Buddha. Um, now the response of the, 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 the challenge of the, the older religions uh, is to meet the challenge and respond creatively to the uh, technological transformation of the, axi of the new axial scientific age. What's the opposite of God? Nihilism, I would say. Uh, uh, despair. A sense I, that there is no value, no meaning, no purpose, and no intrinsic spark of sacredness in the human being. Um, Rwanda, 9-11, Auschwitz is the opposite of God because it is a denial of, of the sacred in, that should be inherent in every single human being that we meet. Karen Armstrong. Thanks for coming on Talk Back and thanks for talking back. That was Karen Armstrong in this very special episode of Talk Back. We hope you enjoyed it. Email us at talkback at dawnnews.tv. Your views are important to us. That's it from me, Wajahat Saeed Khan, and the rest of the Talk Back team. Take care.